basically we are meant to move. And for the majority of it, ex except up until basically the 1980s, we moved for our work. Like Alex's um, information that went out to you, today we're gonna to talk about posture because truthfully, it's something that causes us more and more pain as we get older. And, and as you read in the blog that went out um, last week, 50% of all doctor visits are related to back pain. 50%. The next highest thing is the common cold. So since we've moved off the assembly lines and we've moved into office desks and chairs and cubicles, and hopefully some of you even have a standing desk, we've stopped moving and not moving is what is giving us our biggest problem. It's actually not so much even the posture. It's the fact that we're locked into particular postures for extended periods of time. Um, I was just saying to Alex, you can get those little buzzers that will you wear on your lapel here, and they notice as soon as you start to bend forward a little bit, and it'll, it'll jolt you. But all of the reviews I've read about them is people, like, they get so busy at work that they're getting jolted every 15 seconds. They're, like, throwing them in the garbage. So it's really hard to be able to work on posture with gadgets or um, even prompts. Ultimately, it'll come down to mindfulness or even postural band things, like there's brassiers and, and shoulder and, and back um, stabilizing bands, ortho, orthopedic kind of um, holding things, but people just get, give up on putting them on and taking, you know, taking them on and off and, and they feel uncomfortable after a while. So I wanna give you some basic things that you can use in the office or at home right now that can help you avoid getting locked into a particular posture, whether it's the text neck, neck that's coming forward, or the rolled shoulders that are coming forward, or even the arms on the keyboard being locked into a particular pattern, giving us carpal tunnel syndrome and things like that. Basically, we are meant to move. And for, as you know, 200,000 years, we've been on the planet. And for the majority of it, ex except up until basically the 1980s, we moved for our work. We worked as farmers and hunting and gathering. And even as assembly line workers, we were standing and moving and lifting and moving our bodies constantly. And that's what we're designed to do. We are not designed to stay locked into a position. In fact, the chiropractic organization of North America, both Canada and the United States, says it's basically impossible to hold your, your neutral spine for an hour. We are not designed to do that. Very few people, not even monks in a monastery, hold their posture for an hour straight. It just creates too much contraction and tension and people have to start to fidget because we are wired to move. So before we go and talk about some things, simple things that you can do to move just a little bit at the chair and at the desk, I wanna to talk to you about what neutral spine or neutral posture is. And any of you that go to yoga regularly will hear those terms all the time. And basically it describes the gentle curves that our spine has when it's in a neutral standing position, or even when we're neutrally lying. It's the natural curves of the cervical spine and the lumbar spine, both curving in, and then the thoracic spine up at the top of our chest and shoulders curving out, then our, our glutes curving out with the tailbone. It's a very subtle curve. And depending on what we've been doing with function and non-function, that curve can be out of alignment. So I'm going to demo right now against my wall what neutral spine is. And then I'm going to ask all of you to get up, get over to a little wall, and do the same thing after me. So I'll, let me demo it first. Can you see me over here? Mm -hmm. So I've got my heels up against the floor, uh, the wall. I've got my bum up against the wall. I've got my shoulders, but instead of them being rolled forward, I've rolled them back so that my scapula, those shoulder blades are flat against the wall. And then I'm letting my head come back to the wall with a tiny bit of a chin tuck. This is what's considered neutral spine. At first, it's going to feel tense because 
of the kind of habits that we've gotten ourselves into. And if you were to run a plumb line down me, my ear, my shoulder, my hip socket, and my ankle bone would have a plumb line. Now, in the last little reminder that Alex just sent out to you, he mentioned the acronym CHEK, C-H-E-K. Paul Cech was an Olympic trainer for all of the Olympic athlete team in the United States back in the 80s. And one thing he learned was that all of the athletes wear themselves out. They're all getting new shoulder problems and they're having to get new hips and new knees because basically all of us are out of alignment. There isn't a single human on the planet that's perfectly plumb and has their shoulders exactly level or their hips exactly rotated properly or their feet supinated or pronated. And because of that imbalance from the feet to our shoulders, our spine has to compensate. Because we're a predator, we have to have our eyes exactly horizontal to get accurate depth perception. So the body subconsciously will take pronated, supinated, duck feet, crow feet, whatever is going on lower down and then knock kneed and hips swiveled and everything and have to deal with it through the spine until it gets the head, even if the neck's out like this, level. And that puts a lot of tension in the body. It means some muscles are super tight holding that and others are getting too stretched and they've lost their strength. And this is what causes the majority of the pain for us is when we're in imbalance, we're under some muscles too much tension and some muscles get too weak, they become atrophied. And then we have trouble sleeping and we have lack of nervous system running fluidly through us. It affects all the systems of the body, including hormones and immune system. When we're contracted in certain places of the body, we don't get flow. So you've probably heard that word in yoga, if you've been going to yoga, that ideally we want the body to come back into a relaxed state of flow. Then all the systems run properly. Circulation, hormonal, respiratory, immunological, all of that, digestive. Because even posture even affects digestion. So everybody get up for a little quick step up, come to a wall. And when you come up against the wall, you want to be able to just slip your hand into the lower back curve at the down low above your pelvis and your hand just barely into the curve of your cervical neck. Not two hands, not a arm, just a single palm in between the neck and in between the lumbar spine down low. So just gauge that, just see if you can slide a hand in. So it's, your back and head shouldn't be completely flat against the wall. It should be your shoulders, then your bum, and then your heels and um, the back of your head. Should we be barefoot, barefoot best? Ideally, barefoot. but don't worry about it for the amount of time we have to go, go stripping down too far. Can you feel that? Let your chin come down just a little bit so your neck is long at the back and the head is, and just get a sense of whether your ear and your shoulder and your hip and your ankle bone are kind of in a plumb line with each other. How does that feel? If it feels awkward or, or tight or if it feels, um, like impossible to do, it's an indication that through habit and time and ergonomics at work and, and slouching in the couch and everything that our parents told us not to do has created a bit of a lockdown in certain parts of our body. So now I want to quickly finish up with Paul Check because this is a takeaway that I'd like you to consider doing when you get a chance, when the lockdown opens up enough for you, even before the lockdown, I would, and so would all of Kathy, I, our kinesiologist, our yoga instructor, would all agree that a postural alignment assessment through a Czech trained trainer, so Paul Czech went away and set up a system down in LA 
where he trains trainers to work with plumb lines and grid systems on the ground, and then measures shoulders and hips and knees and all the body to find out which muscles are too tight and which muscles are too weak. Who here golfs or plays tennis? Put up your hand. None of you? I know, Alex used to. Okay. Who here has ever kicked a soccer ball? Who here uses their right foot to push the gas pedal on your car? Right? It's doing a different thing than the left. And if you watch, most people walk, the right foot walks out while the left one tracks forward. What we do in life, either kicking a soccer ball always with the right foot or taking our golf swing always from the right or the left, overworks certain muscles and underworks certain muscles. Who here goes to the gym and does three repetitions on the weak bicep and two on the strong bicep? Nobody. Everyone's doing exactly the same both sides, so the right side always stays stronger and tighter than the left. And these are principles that you will learn if you get a check assessment. After you've unwound the body back to neutral, you're always going to strength train the side that's the weakest one more set than the side that's the strongest. The stretch a little bit longer on the tight side and a little bit less long on the looser side. And that continually helps us come back into alignment as life continually tries to put us into out of balance. Who here always sleeps equally on the left shoulder and the right shoulder in bed? None of us. Always equally big for a postural analysis done and then with that analysis you'll get a training program that'll last about two months using the big swiss balls and you'll open up packs because the front side of our bodies are always tighter than the back side we always overdevelop in the gym the front side especially us guys and you'll strengthen and lengthen and build the core now remember when you came to mountain trek core is from the roof of your mouth basically to your perineum it is not just a six pack. It's every stabilizing ligament, tendon, and fascia that runs from the roof of your mouth, from your tongue to your Kegel muscles. And all of those hold the whole torso and the spine in a position of natural fluidity in a neutral spine so that then when we use our tennis rackets or we kick a soccer ball or we run or do anything, all the limbs come from a place of power. They come from a foundation of a held torso. And so working with Pilates or taking to build not just the, the front of the abdomen, but the back muscles, the obliques that run diagonally across the inside, the throat, all of these have to be built. Any questions about that? Alex will type, well, you, you got the notice, so you know just to Google Czech Institute in the city that you live in, and you'll find out which gyms have a Czech Institute uh, assessor and trainer. And it might cost you 300 bucks. Now, if you, guys, if you have any questions and can't interject with Kirk, feel free to put it in the chat. Absolutely, at any time. Wendy did want to know about trans manual transmission, Kirk. Is there some balance there between using the clutch? <laughs> if you're pushing that clutch down as much as you're pushing the gas, it could be, but then you're, you're going to be jerking down the road a lot. <laughs> um, so even little things like that, when I'm driving my car, I, I keep using my mind to bring my right foot straight. Because for the amount of walking I have to do as a hiking guide, if I had to walk with this right foot to the, out to the side all the time, I would have to have a knee replacement by now. That's how important the posture is to me. Kirk, I think um, this is a good time to launch the poll. I'm really good. curious. So we, we did a quick poll tonight to see where everyone is feeling pain. And it's anonymous. Feel free to answer, please. I was 
asking Kirk earlier, because I personally have a lot of pain in my left neck and left shoulder. And most of that is my posture at my desk. I notice that my left arm tends to creep in and my head tends to creep forward. I don't know if that's because I'm looking at stuff on my screen, trying to read smaller font. Um, but even I'm, thir I'm like 32 and I'm starting to feel it. So the, the future of that being chronic or leading to some debility, that's kind of scary to me. Yeah, and you're not alone in it, Alex. The majority of the workforce um, in Canada, um, back related work loss is number two after stress. And it's not backs from lifting heavy objects on, a, on an assembly line. It's backs from slouching, atrophy, and, and staying locked in one position for hours upon days, upon months, upon years. So let's, let's um, it looks like we've got neck pain as number one and tied with shoulder pain and then hip pain. Great. Anybody have wrist issues? It's very common because again on the keyboard we're locked in to particular positions. So I'm going to give you a couple of at the seat things that you can do with me right now that you can do at the office, but what's going to get you to do them? What's going to make you decide to take a stretch at work or at home while you're working? Anybody? Well, this, we'd all like to have less pain. This, right? this is what will make you do it. We all will live with the pain, unfortunately. We need first. So as important as any of the, the events, any of the Zooms you have to attend, any of the meetings, any of the chores you have to make sure you get done, if you use this as your memory brain like I do, I set an alarm in this once at least in the morning and once in the afternoon and it pings me and then i go okay i've got one minute i might use it to just sit and breathe because i want to lower cortisol or i could also do any of these stretches but without something to remind us to do something different how easy is it to get caught in in something we're doing and all of a sudden 25 minutes go by or two hours go by and we haven't even stood up or let alone change the position of our head or neck. So this is the first thing if you want to create new habits is you need some help. You need something to remind you. So you could set that up on your screen of your computer as a reminder alert that just automatically happens three, four times a day for you or on your phone, what, but you need the help. You need a coach there, somebody that's gonna remind you to either stand up whenever the phone rings and walk around the room or the office. Whenever you're talking on the phone, it's an excuse to get up and move. And then you could have an alert or a reminder to do any of these stretches I'm gonna share with you right now. So I'm gonna start with the wrist. <laughs> So most of our wrists are like this all day on the computer. See the angle? Ideally, ergonomically, they're going to be more like that so that they're in neutral position. But if our arms start to drop, we're putting tension through the, te through the tendons going through this part of our head. So we have to start to move them in the opposite direction. So I want you to take your arms out straight from yourself and then take the fingertips towards the floor and pull your fingertips back. Ideally, you want to feel a stretch through the forearms here. You can also do it this way and just lift the elbows by pushing the palms together. So I'm lifting my elbows up and I feel a pull through here. Okay. And whenever we go to lengthen something, especially tendon or tightish skinnier muscles, you want to give a good 15 seconds. So that I think of that as at least five big long breaths. So just hold that for five good long breaths. And if you feel like it's getting a little longer, then just push and lift the elbows just a tiny bit more. And once you get a bit more space, you just lift a little bit more. But you're not trying to get anywhere. You're just staying at that kind of slight tension level that your exhalation allows just a bit more surrendering. 
Okay. Now we're going to come down to the neck. So I want you to take your right hand and grab either the back leg of the chair you're in or the under part of the seat of the chair you're in. Now, here's what most of our necks are doing all day long is this. And the head weighs about 11 pounds all day long. That bowling ball's pulling on the back of our neck and right down into the upper traps and down into the shoulders. So we want to make sure we're getting movement in the neck. So as you're pulling down the shoulder with the right arm, I want you to just let the head can come over to the left. And I'm basically aiming my ear towards the shoulder. And I'm just letting gravity do the work. So I'm not pulling it down like this. That's too much. Just stay with the breath. Take a long, deep breath, five deep, long breaths. And then gently come up. And then we'll go to the other side. Left hand holds the back leg of the chair or underneath the chair and it's pulling the shoulder down and then I let the ear come towards the other shoulder. See if you can keep the shoulder rolling back too rather than forward. So we're kind of opening through the chest a little bit. And then lastly, the way the vertebrae are stacked in our neck, they're not meant to roll this way around the back. The way that they fit into each other it puts a strain on the vertebrae and can actually kind of break down the discs that sit between the vertebra bones. But you can let the head just gently come forward, chin to one shoulder, and then back down, tracing your collarbones, chin to other shoulder. Just gently through the range of motion across the front. And going back to the wrists, you can always get more synovial fluid in your joints by doing wrist circles, elbow circles, and shoulder circles. So again, we're opening things up and we're taking them out of a static hold position and getting things to flow. Now working down from the neck and into the shoulders, we're gonna take, and I'll sit sideways with you so you can see me. I'm gonna take my hands around and interlock my fingers and they can just come down behind my seat of my chair. And sometimes I do this one well, I let my head come forward and my chin carefully and slowly just trace my collarbones from one shoulder to the other. So that's opening up through the pecs, opening up through the shoulders. So we're rolling back and down. Now I'm gonna get up and do my upper thoracic back, which tends to roll for, forward on the computer. And that's how we get that. There's a terrible name for it. They call it Dowager's Hump, which I think is very sexist. But basically, it's that kind of rolled up shoulders that you can see in elderly people. So for this one, you can pick a wall in your office. And I'm going to come back over to this wall. Hopefully you can see me. And I'm going to take and drop my hands down just below shoulder width and walk my feet out and then let my whole back sag towards the floor. And notice how my head is hanging down. I don't want any tension through the neck. And I can just pull out by carefully pulling from one hip to the other and just feel through those long back muscles, which ones might need a little bit more lengthening than the others eventually you want to be in an L shape your legs are 90 to your torso so this is one that all of us can do a lot to start to get the back to basically sag rather than curve so we want a concave back rather than a convex back when we're doing that because again all day long at, at our desk we're convexed we're rolled forward 
How's that feel? Give a thumbs up if it feels good. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to do a spinal twist because again, the spine has these discs between them. And every year we get older, the blood flow basically after the age of 28 to 30 stops getting direct blood flow to these, these shock absorber discs between the ver vertebra in our back. And without blood flow coming to them, the only chance that they stay plump and elastic is if we massage the muscles around those discs so they absorb through the disc wall more liquids and then they can pass waste products back and forth. And then the discs stay elastic and springy and, and we, we don't shrink. The reason why we sh lose height as we age is that the discs get smaller and smaller and smaller because of lack of fluidity. So spinal twists in yoga are all about that. So I'm sitting in my chair and I'm just gonna turn to one side or the other and I'm gonna take this hand and just use it gently to help me turn my whole spine and then I'm gonna turn my head and look out over that same shoulder that's behind me. So you wanna just see if you can get it right from the bottom of your pelvis through the base of your skull a sense of a corkscrew, a gentle corkscrew. And that's gonna help those discs stay, stay plump and full of fluid, and also helps massage all the internal organs. So your liver, your kidneys, and your, your spleen and pancreas and in, intestinal tract all gets massaged when we twist. And then you would just do the same thing the other direction for five breaths. Keep your head nice and tall as you're doing it. And your head should follow your gaze. So I'm looking into the back corner of my room. Remember, don't push anything in yoga. It's always like, imagine you're pulling toffee. So you've heated something up and you're just letting it kind of get longer slowly. And it's the exhalation that's warming the toffee of the muscles and allowing them to lengthen. So you're never bobbing and you're never like pulling. If you're grimacing, you're pulling too hard or pushing too hard. You should be able to do the release with a smile. That's what all the yogis say. Now we're gonna go to um, the hips because I saw that quite a few of you feel the hips lock in, which is natural because we're sitting so much. So just take, I'm gonna take my chair back a little bit so you can see me. And you've done this before with mountain trek after every hike before we get in the vehicle but this you can do sitting down in your chair i'm taking my left leg up resting my um just above the ankle my shin onto my thigh and i'm pulling my left toes towards my left knee that protects the knee and then i'm just going to gently come forward and this is going to start to feel it in my left hip joint i'm going to feel the glute med all my glutes are gonna to start to get a little stretch and it'll even start to move into my psoas or my hip flexor a tiny bit. So this is gonna open the hips up for all of the sitting we're doing. And ideally I'm keeping my back straight as I'm just coming down with each exhalation, just a smidgen more, just another release and another release. And then gently up and then we can switch over and do the other side. So I'm trying to keep my shin kind of parallel to the floor if I can, and my right toes are drawing up towards that knee. And then again, I'm taking like a jackknife approach from my hip. So my back is coming forward all in one line. All my vertebra are in one line as I'm gently coming with each exhalation. A little bit further forward, folding over that figure four leg. Kirk, while we're holding this, what are your thoughts on doing inversions for releasing the spine? Inversions are so good for the brain. Every time we can get the brain down lower than the heart, we're going to flush the brain with more, more blood. So taking a break a couple of times through the workday to even just if you can, you have a place, a nice office to do this, lie down on the floor and with your legs up the wall, you're gonna get 
great blood flow and circulation coming back up and bathe the brain again. If you're going to be doing, you know, plow or headstands or handstands, you've got to have a pretty strong practice to do that. But the same benefit happens, of course, because you're taking gravity and reversing it and you're putting the feet up higher so they don't keep swelling up all day with kind of pooled blood and everything rushes down towards the head. And then when you finish the inversion, you're going to be that much smarter and you're, 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 it's better than espresso. What about the specifics of using a mechanism like an inversion table or sometimes? Those are great. And those are really good for people's spines when the back gets tight and the compression through the spine is happening those inverted you lie in a bed and with boots hooked into a um, little ankle boots hooked into a bar and then the bar tip the bed tips up and you're hanging at various angles you can go right up to almost 90 degrees they're great inversions yogis say that the best way to reverse wrinkles in your face is do inversions best way to avoid hair loss do inversions basically Gravity is just pulling it constantly on us this way. And so reversing it helps reverse everything. Um, so, so that basically covered my six at the desk little stretches that you could do, or at least in the office. Is there anything that anybody's feeling in their body that wouldn't get attended to by those six things? We had a question earlier about um, knee pain and specifically coming from IT band. And I, I personally have this as well. So curious if um, I know mine's from use, mine's from just walking or hiking a bunch. And so it gets inflamed and stretching and ice has helped. What else would you recommend, whether that's posture related or it's movement related? Well, my phone just rang, so I'm going to get up and answer that right now. And then while I'm walking around talking, I'm, I'm just going to be able to just take short steps and, and get some blood flow. I might even swing my arms a little bit while I'm talking on the phone, because the whole thing about aging is really about lack of circulation and lack of blood flow. So getting up, having something like every time the phone rings, you have to stand and move is just a great habit to get into. And then move, like roll your shoulders while you're talking on the phone and let your neck come down and do a couple of things that haven't been happening for maybe four or six hours already that day. Um, IT bands mostly are tight because of how we get to work and get home. Most of us are taking too long a stride. And if we go back to Paul Check, after he looks at total postural alignment, he looks at natural gait and gait is the length of our stride and for a biped like us the length of our stride should be no longer from ankle bone to ankle bone than the width of our shoulder joint so we're designed to take bicycle pedal distant steps and then the hip flexor doesn't have to lift the whole way to the leg into a long sidewalk walk where we're throwing the whole leg out in a long stride that overworks the hip flexor, which is actually a kind of skinny muscle that runs from the femur bone in the, our thigh back through our internal organs to the inside of our lumbar and, and pelvis. And when we take too long a stride, it shortens that muscle and it causes chronic troubles in knees and back, back especially. Most lower back pain is related to the hip flexor slash psoas. It's, that's the other name for it. But I'll show you a quick stretch for that. And this one I do every night for my yoga before I go to bed because it's really hard to always have your posture perfect. So I've got my left knee down on the floor. And if your knees are sensitive, you can always put a, a blanket or a towel underneath your knee. And then I take my right foot forward into a lunge, but my toes are ahead of my knee. So see the angle my shin is at? It's not like this. So my foot's out ahead of my knee, and then I'm pulling my pubic bone up with my abs. So my abs are helping tip my pelvis under this way. And then you'll feel a gentle pull here where the hip flexor attaches to the femur, and then it runs through into the lower back. So this tipping the pelvis under helps lengthen the hip flexor. And then if you want, you can 
Lift your arm up like you would in a yoga class. Roll the shoulder back and down. But the main move of these lunges is to lengthen the hip flexor where it attaches to the femur here. For, for people that have chosen to do a stand-up desk because they know that sitting is the new smoking, that introduces... Great. It introduces new problems though, right? I mean, you, you get, like you were saying, you're still staying in one position. Yes. Do you have any recommendations for when you start to use a standing desk? Absolutely. When, when we started to do research on standing desks, and we have one for Katie at our office because we do believe in it, is that if you can get one that can go up and down. So again, you're changing position all the time. So behind you, Alex, I see a gray uh, Swiss exercise ball. Even having one of those so that I sit using my core and I'm moving my pelvis and my hips for 20 minutes, then I get up and trade it for a chair for 20 minutes. And then I go back to the ball because after 20 minutes, it's hard to have that mental focus that you don't sway your back on a ball. And the same thing with a standing desk, stand for 20 minutes and then lower it and then put your bum on a ball and sit for 20 minutes. So it's the shifting around and moving that is ultimately what our body needs. It doesn't want any one particular position, even like you say, standing all the time at the desk, Alex. So is, is, does that mean that movement is actually more important than ideal posture, that we should prioritize first, and then when we have to be stagnant, find good posture? Here's how Paul, first, before any movement, you find balanced alignment. Because once you start moving in unbalanced alignment, you wear joints out in the wrong way. So before he would let anyone start running on a treadmill or running marathons or doing anything like that, as a professional trainer, he would make sure that they've got neutral spine and all of the bodies back into a neutral position and the core can fire. Once that happens, then you can start running, you can start moving, but that's for being athletic for just moving for circulation in your office. I personally like the idea of making, as soon as my phone rings, I stand. It becomes a habit like brushing my teeth. And then at least I've got myself up and then I walk around my little, my little room at least while I'm talking. I know lots of you folks even hold your meetings outside. You'll, you'll, have, you'll have a scheduled call, conference call. And I know lots of um, you executives are walking around the block while you're having that conference call and that's that's an amazing thing to do you're getting outside you're getting fresh air you're getting temperature change you're possibly even seeing something green all of that so yes i would say that circulation trumps all exercise that's why the american medical association says we need those 10,000 steps it's not for losing weight it's for circulation and then under the umbrella of the 10,000 steps. Everything we do from uh, a bar method class to swimming at the pool to walking the dog for 20 minutes after dinner all accumulates under that movement. And we're constantly working on the right form for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's really important to, if you don't have a regular stretching pr program, go to a yoga class once a week and it'll start to instill a mindfulness about posture for sure it helped me i started yoga when i was 20 and thank god i did because in my mid 60s i don't wake up tight ever in the morning ever but i do my yoga every night before bed and it's only 15 minutes but i know which area of my body i need to target and just creating a, an awareness and then some habitual things like that make all the difference. And then for core, if you start getting to a, a Pilates class or, and if you feel like your core is really weak, I highly recommend taking a Pilates class where you're using um, either the Cadillac or the Reformer because then you're getting micro um, focused adjustments with a, almost a one-on-one -on -one trainer to make sure that you're building the right stabilizers rather than going to a mat class with 30 people you could be using your hip flexors for the whole class and no one would tell you different 
Kirk, any like, other questions? Now that a lot of people are working from home, not everyone has a desk at home. So some people have been forced to set up workstations wherever, and the couch is a pretty common place. Yeah. What tips would you offer for working from the couch? Well, even like me and my, you can't see it right now, but even when I sit in my chair, I don't sit up against the back of my chair. I've got my sit bones right up at the front of the chair. You can see there's air behind me. Then that causes me to use my core to hold my posture. So I'm, I'm sitting like this. Now, as long as my, my laptop, and I use a, a support tool like this, on my desk so that my laptop is on an angle and it supports my wrist while I'm on it. So if my laptop is at the right angle and my screen is at the right angle that I don't have to bring my head forward. So having a screen up so that you're looking eye directly at it, basically I can sit for quite a bit of time in neutral spine here. But if I'm on a couch, it's gonna be so easy to, to start to slouch into it and then everything's gonna go in the wrong direction. So if you're gonna use a couch, sit on the edge of the couch. And so that you have to use your back muscles and your, your core muscles to hold the torso up. And then see what you can go, do to get the ergonomics of both the keyboard and then the, the um, laptop to the height you need. Ergonomics is critical because of the amount of time we're locked in a position that's not good. So if I'm looking down all the time at my computer, it's basically, there goes my neck and my shoulders and my upper traps. You've, you've got to set your scene up. It's, it's, this is your life. And so get the ergonomics right and then move around when you can and then do those stretches once or twice through the day. And you probably, and then go for a walk after dinner and swing your arms. And you'll probably get through it okay. Any, any other questions around chronic pain for the back or anything like that? And don't, don't be hard on yourselves. There isn't a human being that has perfect posture. It's a, it's a work in progress. And you know, it, it can change. You can start doing yoga at 80 and you can lengthen muscles that have been chronically tight your whole life. You can start strength training at 80 and you can build muscle that you never had before. So the body is like an, a miracle in its way that it's so resilient. But starting at any point, at any age, you can start to change old habits and old lockdown positions and restriction. Can I, can I just ask a quick question? I was wondering about those shoes that don't really have the supports. They just kind of mold to your feet. Are those good for posture? Are you talking about like the um, Kenyan like, rounded bottom shoe, Dorothy? Or are you talking about like a barefoot style shoe? Yeah, like a barefoot style shoe. Now, is that, does that align us back to what, where we came from? Or is that yeah, turning off? Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've been wearing guiding with barefoot shoes bef for a long time. And I, some of you know, I even hiked just straight barefoot. Um, and I started doing that before I was a guide at Mountain Truck because I had a wilderness skill school and I had to train myself to walk differently. And this is the biggest problem with barefoot shoes is people buy a shoe with no protection underneath it because it's, it's like a moccasin and you could roll it right up. It's so soft and supple and has no padding. But if you don't change the way you land on the ground, so you would land on the ground, ball, heel, toe, when you walk barefoot down at the beach, you're going to unconsciously do that because there's more protection in the ball of the foot than there is in the heel. And when we land on our heel first, like we do in our shoes on sidewalks, that's why we roll ankles so quickly and easily. Um, there's just a very small little surface area that the foot's landing on and we jar all the way up through the knee um, and make compression. But if you're going to wear a barefoot shoe, you have to change the way you walk. You have to really shorten your stride and you have to, take whatever 40 to 60 years of, of walking habit and turn it around. Otherwise, I wouldn't recommend using them. There's no padding. But I highly recommend walking around in your yard on your grass barefoot 
It's so healthy for the structure of the foot, for the plantar arch, for for the ligaments and tendons. It makes the foot alive. Should we be walking barefoot at any time we can? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do it where it's safe, though. Do it in your yard or down at the beach. Um, and then eventually the pads, like the pads underneath my feet, that's where the majority of my fat is, is <laughs> at the bottom of my feet. They just start to get thicker and thicker, not the skin so much, but the cushion. Your feet just start to get this natural buildup of, of um, protective fat on the bottoms of your feet. And that comes from using your feet barefoot. Yeah. That, wow. Cool. I never knew that. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. One last request to go over the stretches again. So maybe as everyone's signing off, you could kind of just run through. Sure. We've got the wrist down this way to lengthen it. We've got the shoulders by rolling back and down. We've got the wall hang. And you can do that off of a window or off your desk, but you want to get that whole back to lengthen by pulling back out and you feel a tension right through your fingerprint tips and a sense of concaving the back and the head just hangs. And then you've got the spinal twist turning one way and then the other. And then you've got the neck where I'm holding my right hand underneath the chair and letting my head fall to the left and vice versa. And then you can do the tracing your collarbones just across the front, not around the back. Don't go around the back, pinches nerves. And then lastly for your hips, that figure four position where I cross my leg over my thigh and just come forward like a jackknife with a long straight back coming down over my bent thigh. Thank you, Kirk. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. We're going to take next week off. Um, we have our at-home retreat this coming weekend. Um, and so we're going to take a little time off after that. So we'll take a week off, and then we'll come back in two weeks for the next happy hour. Um, and just as this week, we'll send the update ahead of time so you're aware of it. Just to, awesome. just to recap on what the... Um, at home health reset that we're offering this weekend and we're offering them about every two weeks now almost isn't it alex pretty close to yeah yeah we've um we've got one coming up this weekend so june 19th through 21st and then we're going to come back to pacific time july 10th through 12th and then uh i believe july 20 what do we got july 25th and 26th so 24th 25th 26th um, and then we're just scheduling some for August now. And they run from four o'clock Friday until four o'clock Sunday, basically uh, an immersion with cooking classes and Jen on for nutrition and Kathy and Christy leading three different exercise classes. And then I'll take people through a visioning board on a computer program and work on um, kind of like a, how do we take our life vision for our health and put it into some habits so that by the end of the, the two and a half days, basically, you're going to have touched into nutrition and fitness and we'll do some sleep hygiene and some mindfulness exercises so that you can maybe redial a couple of things that you want to adjust in your life for healthy habits. So that's the focus of those weekends. Great. Okay. Till next time. Nice to see you all. Take good care. Yeah.